Well, this morning, if you want to open in your Bibles uh, to Ephesians 6.16, what we're looking at is the shield of faith. And what's amazing about that I want you to kind of single out in your minds, as you look at verse 16, it says, above all, Ephesians 6.16, taking the shield of faith, so there is a choice here, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So learning how to quench or extinguish all of Satan's fiery attacks. But it's by faith. It's the shield which is faith. And so this morning, we need to look at what God's word is so good at. God's word doesn't just kind of uh, throw something out there and leave us to try and figure out what God means. God always illustrates the truth he wants us to respond to. That's why the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness. That was an illustration to the children of Israel. That, that the only remedy to the serpent's bite was for God to lift up that remedy, which was the brazen serpent lifted up in the wilderness, and they had to believe. And so God illustrated the belief. By the way, they couldn't look at just anything in the wilderness. They had to look at one pole. That was the only hope. You know, if someone said, well, I don't like snakes, I'm going to look at a cow, they were dying. If someone else said, ah, you know, I don't think it'll work, they died. See, it was very specific, it was very direct, it was very simple. Either you believed God's word and God said, look, or you didn't. That's the same with this. It's very simple. Uh, if you notice what it says, it says taking the shield of faith. What is faith? We defined it two weeks ago. I'll, I'll define it again. So then faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith is believing what God says. It's not just believing anything. It's not just believing truth. Faith, biblically defined, is believing truth that God has spoken, that God has revealed. It's not encyclopedic faith. It's biblical faith, which is supernatural faith, which invokes or causes or unleashes the work of God, and he extinguishes these fiery darts. Well, let me give you an example. Since you're in Ephesians, turn to the, uh, let's go to the Gospel of John, and I want to show you uh, one person, Gospel by John. I'd like to show you the shield of faith happening in someone's life. Gospel of John, last chapter, chapter 21. And what we're going to do is... Um, Look at how Peter resisted Satan devouring him by faith. Now you say, uh, he didn't do very well when he was tempted that night to deny the Lord. You're right, but boy, he learned his lesson. And look how Jesus, in chapter 21, in verses 18 and 19, how Jesus laid on Peter a lifelong burden. I don't know if I could go through this. I mean, all of us kind of in one sense go through it. Jesus told Peter he was going to die, and he kind of implied how he was going to die. Now all of us are going to die. Wages of sin is death. We're all going to die. But Peter knew he was going to go through an unwilling form of death. And we all know that Peter died a martyr. Uh, look at verses 18 and 19. Jesus speaking, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger you girded yourself and you walked where you wished. Now keep reading. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Now, John 21, look at verse 19. Lest you wonder, well, that could mean almost anything. Well, look at verse 19. This he, that's Jesus, spoke, signifying by what death he, that's Peter, would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Wow. Jesus said, you're going to die a death that you wouldn't really want to happen to you. You're going to be a martyr. And we know from church history, almost universally, the church historians, through all the, the uh, people's accounts, this isn't in the Bible, it's just in Eusebius' book of church history and Fox's book of martyrs, that Peter was led out to be crucified, but he said, I don't want to be crucified like Jesus was. Would you crucify me upside down? And so the Romans thought that would be fun, and they did. And Peter had his hands stretched out, and he was taken where he wasn't willing to go. But look, look at the last part of verse 19. Jesus uh, said to him, follow me. Jesus made two choices for Peter to live by. He gave him a simple 
twofold option, either to follow me or not. You understand how simple that is? That's simplicity. Jesus said, you're going to die this awful, probably martyr's death, probably crucified upside down. That's the fact. Now you have two choices. Are you going to follow me, which means go by faith, which negates fear? Or are you going to through your life fearing that event? Now, whoop, other direction. Peter had two choices, so do we. And the shield of faith is constantly one of two choices we have in life. Either we can, by faith, take God at his word. You say, which part? Did you know the Bible says that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God? It doesn't say which part of it is, is to be the sword of the Spirit to you. Any part of it is the sword of the Spirit. Jesus completely decimated the devil with three obscure verses from Deuteronomy 8. Satan is felled when we believe the word of God. That's faith. So either we can follow Jesus. Notice what it says in verse 19. Jesus said to Peter, follow me. That's faith. Following Jesus requires faith because it goes against everything everyone else is doing in this world more and more and more. Follow Jesus by listening to him. How do we listen to him? Through his word. He calls this his word. He calls this him speaking to us by his spirit through his word. So we follow him by listening to him in the word, believing what he said, and that is constituting the life of faith, which is following him. It's always hard. It's walking in the spirit. It's paddling against the current of the world. We've talked about that so many times. You and I were launched into life going down a river where everyone else is going the same direction and no paddles are needed. The current takes you the right direction toward destruction, toward death, toward separation from God eternally, toward eternal punishment. That's where the river is flowing and everyone is going over the end in that cascade into a chasm of blackness of darkness. That's life for everyone that's ever lived, including us. But when we receive Jesus Christ by faith, we start paddling against the stream, and it gets really hard. Because people say, what are you doing? Your lifestyle makes me feel bad. You act like what I'm doing is wrong because you don't do it. See, that's why the world hates us. When we don't go along with them, we condemn them, and they hate us for that. They don't want any lights on. They just want to, pa- they want to float and, and have their lifelong float until they crash into the chasm. But we go against the world, and we deny our own flesh. By the way, in the canoe with us, as we're paddling, as a trader, it's our flesh. And it doesn't want to. That's why it's so hard. It's always hard to follow Christ. It's always hard to live by faith. It's always hard to take the word of God and resist the devil and my own fleshly desires. Or, so, so here's choice number one for Peter. Choice number two is to live by fear. Immediately we're devoured by Satan because we listen to his lies and we doubt what God says. See, the real essence of the shield of faith is either we're going to doubt what God says and immediately that doubt opens a way for Satan to devour us. And he will keep giving us more lies. And then we will end up doubting God's word, which is the only remedy to all of our problems, the only source of hope. And it's always simple, by the way, to do this. This is our default setting. Fear is a default setting. Why do you think the most repeated negative prohibition in the Bible is fear not? Because fear is the opposite of faith, and faith overcomes fear. And Satan's realm is fear, and God's realm is faith. And the shield of faith is standing with God and believing any part of his revelation, and that opens the way of us defeating the attack, the fiery darts, and all that Satan is doing. This is our default setting, fear is. It's always simple. We just do nothing. We just float. Did you know this morning, if in your Christian life you're not doing anything, you're floating, and Satan is winning. Because if you're not actively, aggressively, by choice, volitionally going into feeding your soul the words and allowing you and me to hear his voice and to know him and to follow him, then you're floating. And whenever you float, the current takes you away from God. 
That's the choice every day. Faith going against the world, my flesh, and the devil, or fear doing nothing, paralyzed, floating. Well, what did Peter do? Well, let's go to the book of Peter real quick because Peter is amazing. Look at 1st, 2nd Peter. I just want to show you one verse in 1st Peter and a couple of verses in 2nd Peter, but uh, you're in John and then Acts, Romans, and all of Paul's epistles, and then Hebrews, James, 1st Peter. There we go, 1st Peter. What did Peter do? Well, when Peter was on death row, he was such a target for the devil. Remember, Jesus I already read to you in John 21. Jesus said, you're going to die a death you don't want to die. They're going to stretch out your arms. They're going to take you where you don't want to go. Peter became the most well-known Christian in the world. He became known as the, the rock upon which Christ was building his church. You know, people got all mixed up about that. He was considered the chief of the apostles. He was considered to be Christ's right-hand man. And he became a real target. So they hunted him down. So here he is on death row. Think of being hunted down, arrested, and imprisoned. Then think of all those days of waiting in prison, wondering, sleepless night, endless days. Think of separation from your family and friends with no contact with anyone. And then think of the day and being led out to execution. To be led out, to be nailed, and to actually say, I'd like to be nailed upside down. Wow. What, what was it that we see in, in Peter's life? Well, here, I've got to turn this thing around. I have propensity to go the wrong way. The shield of faith is trusting God's word. Did Peter learn something? After Jesus told him he was going to have this horrific, protracted, unwilling, martyr's kind of death, how did Peter do? Well, look at 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. I love this because... Um, Actually, I'll start in 3 and read verse 4. Uh, the words Peter used mean so much to me that I distilled down what I think the whole book of Revelation is about in the two words that are in verse 3. Look what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a what? Living hope. Did you know that that totally distills down what you and I are to be living out every day of our life. We're supposed to be a living picture of hope in God. That we know God is working everything together for good. Everything around us, everything in our nation, everything in our life, everything in our health, everything in our family, God is actively, supernaturally, sovereignly orchestrating every event. And we live in hope. So he says, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now look at his, his preparation, his shield of faith, his trusting God. Look what he says in verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away, here it is, reserved in heaven for you. You know what Peter said? doesn't matter how they kill me, I have reservations. Peter had a shield of faith. He trusted God's word. He knew when Jesus told him, don't, don't be afraid, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go prepare, I'm going to come and get you, I'm going to receive you, I'm going to take you home. Peter believed that. It became in him a shield of faith. Did you know if, if we could have seen Peter walking out to be crucified the way God saw him, it would have been a little different than what the Roman soldiers saw? They saw a wizened, old, weathered, leather-skinned fisherman man who was in his 60s, and, and most people in the biblical times only lived to be in their 50s. We know that because they've done an extensive archaeology of the tombs through the teeth and found out the age of the average age of most people in Christ's time, they lived in their 50s. If you were in your 60s, you were really old. If you were like Barzilla of Gilead and 80, you were really old, you know? And so Peter was old, and he looked old. But when he walked out to be crucified, if you could have seen him, what you would have seen is a man that still had those shoes, those, those feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. He had those shoes of peace still on. And he walked peacefully to his death. You would have seen a man who had his, his waist girded 
and, and truth was keeping his mind from going every direction. He was not thinking all kinds of crazy things. He still had on that breastplate of righteousness, and there was a lot of, a lot of marks of battle, of close-up battle, of him getting whacked and shot, but that breastplate was still shiny there, and you would have seen that helmet on. And there were many clear blows to that helmet where Satan had done his best to to come up behind and try and short-circuit his assurance of salvation. But I think the most amazing thing to have seen as he walked to that cross would to have seen that shield of faith because it would have been deeply scarred and filled with arrows because I'm sure that Satan was shooting him with many fiery darts. But how could the Lord do this to you after you were... I mean, you were the one right there. You were on the Mount of Transfiguration, and you're the one, and boy, remember, you're the one that denied him, and he was just shooting every kind of arrow of doubt and despair. And Peter said, no. In fact, look what he said. Second Peter. Remember, I told you there's two passages. Look at Second Peter chapter 1. This is just before this event. Peter is writing his very last words of his life as he is getting ready to become a prisoner of the emperor until he was executed. And look what he says in 2 Peter 1. It's even clearer than in 1 Peter 1. He says in verse 12, For this reason I will be not negligent to remind you of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. He said, I'm just kind of repeating stuff to you. Yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this. What does verse 13 say? What do you consider he was in? This what? Tent tent. You know what Peter said? Life is camping. Heaven is home. Life is camping. Heaven is home. I'm just camping. I'm in a tent. The tent is wearing out. The tent is soon going to get pierced with nails. He's going to be crucified. He said, this is just my tent. Heaven is home. As long as I'm in this tent, verse 13, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent. Now, I could talk about tents for a long time. My father used to lead expeditions. My father took, took groups by the dozens to the furthest north reaches of Canada. I mean, they would go two weeks solid trekking northward toward Hudson's Bay. He would feed them all. He, he, he knew how to live off the land with large groups. And they portaged and hiked and carried. And when I got old enough, his rule was, when I was old enough to see over grass that was knee high, about as high as this little podium or this little bench right here, when I could see over that, he said, you're old enough to come with me. I used to sleep at night with my toes on the bottom mattress and I would hold the headboard and I would try and go to sleep stretched out hoping I would grow a little bit at night so I could be tall enough to see over the grass. And I'd run out and no matter how much I would stretch, I never got any taller. So, you know, I just got a backache. But uh, when I finally got to be this tall, he let me come on the first trip. I never wanted to go back. It was awful. I mean, to live in that old tent, and it was so, I mean, you couldn't find a comfortable spot to, to lay in that tent because we just put it out in the Canadian wilderness. And, I mean, he got up in the dark at 4 o'clock to go fishing and woke me up and dragged me into the canoe with him because he had to catch enough fish to feed the two dozen or 18 or however many he was feeding that day. And he would fish starting at 4 a.m. I mean, and when it rained, the tent dripped course it dripped because I touched it and he told me not to touch it but I touched it anyway and it dripped on me all night long I didn't like camping and when my dad finally says hey we're going home oh man you couldn't hold me back who likes that old drippy rough painful uncomfortable tent now look back you know that shortly verse 14 I must put off my tent just as the Lord Jesus Christ showed me he said, Jesus told me long ago I was going to have my tent taken off. I was going to stretch out my arms in a way I didn't want to go, and I was going to be carried somewhere I didn't want to go. He said, and that's soon to happen to me. But the shield of faith, I'm trusting God's word. Earthly life is camping. It's unpleasant. It's uncomfortable. It's hard. It's, it's very insecure. Anything can come through that tent. 
but heaven is home. And that's where I'm going. See, Peter believed what Jesus said. Peter had that shield of faith. And, and what we see from the Bible is that Satan has always wanted from the original sin onward to make us not trust God. The shield of faith was what God, believing God at his word is what God's always wanted. And what Satan has always wanted is for us to doubt God. So real quick, let's go back to Genesis 3. I want to talk about original sin and the shield of faith. And I think you'll see where we're going. Because Peter overcame the devil, resisting him by faith. What does the Bible say? Well, from the beginning, this is what Satan has done. Genesis 3. And I'm going to go through the original four temptations that came to Eve in Genesis 3. And original sin was the first time the shield of faith was neglected. And it's the only way to resist Satan's attack from the beginning. Have you ever noticed what led up to the original sin? It was Eve distrusting, mistrusting, and doubting God's word that led all of us into disaster. Remember that. Doubting, mistrusting, distrusting God brought the whole human race through Eve's sin and Adam joining in went to all of us and we're all sinners. Just as Satan's temptation targeted Eve's trusting God, so every fiery dart that comes our way follows the same course. Now look at Genesis 3, 1 to 5. The first thing that the devil says in 3, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. Now you might say, how do we know who this is? Revelation 12 tells us and Revelation 20. Both of them say that the serpent in the garden was Satan. This was not an amazing snake. It was an amazing creature that Satan used. But the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said? Temptation number one, and it will be this way, until heaven. The primary thing Satan wants to do in every one of our lives, by any means possible, whether it's a professor, whether it's a news article, whether it's a disaster in our life, or whether it's just something so enticing that we want it more than what God's word says, we will doubt God's word. What will happen is, we'll start wondering, did God really say that? Is his word really accurate? It might have a mistake. It might mean something different than it plainly says. And doubting God's word. What Satan wants is for us to doubt God's word. We doubt God's word when we doubt God. Satan wants us to believe God's word is just like any other book. It's nice, it's helpful, it's not absolute. Satan wants us to question God's word. If he can't get us to do that, he wants us to avoid God's word or neglect God's word or whatever it takes to get us out of regular contact with God. The word is the truth about God. We only grow, we only commune, we're only strengthened. The only thing that, that operates us is truth about God. This is his truth. It's not general truth. That only can take us so far. General revelation can only bring you up to the doorway. It can't get you in. Specific, written, inspired revelation is all that gets us in, and it's all that keeps us going. And Satan will do anything to get us distanced. Do you know what's between the Bible and some people? Their hobby. Do you know what's between the Bible and other people? their athletics, maybe it's their workout, maybe it's their social life, but it's what comes first before God. See, whatever is first on your list is most important and you will not neglect. I know people that, that there are things in their life they will not neglect, you know that about them. They are fastidious, they are religious about those things. God says this, you can either actively doubt God or passively doubt him. Actively is, I don't think it's true, it's historically wrong, it's morally wrong, it's whatever. That's active disbelief. That's not for most of us. Most of us, it's passive disbelief. 
We don't believe this is more important than anything else. We would rather do many other things. Think in the last 168 hours of the last week since we were last here, last Sunday. What has pushed God out of the way? Whatever it is, is Satan's tool to make you doubt God. And Satan wants us to doubt whatever it takes to get us out of regular contact with God's word. Well, secondly, doubt God's goodness. Notice what it says in verse 1. Uh, not only did he say, has God indeed said, but he says, did God really say you shall not eat of every, every tree? Do you know what this is a direct attack on? Whether God is good. Whether God knows best. Whether God really has my best intentions. What Satan wants us to do is doubt God's goodness. We doubt God when we doubt he's good. Satan wants us to believe that God is trying to hold out on us. Or Satan wants us to believe God is robbing us of some good times. Or God's out of touch with our needs. You know, he is kind of from a long time ago. He doesn't, needs have changed. And my needs are paramount. And, and God isn't good if he doesn't want me to have that or to do that. Or that God missed that disaster we just went through. God isn't good. He doesn't know what I just went through. He wasn't there. Or he messed up on how he made us. Many people feel that. They, they down deep dislike who they are. And they, they desperately want to be something or someone else. That, that's this whole gender fluidity. Did you know God designed us to the very basic DNA levels to be a specific person? And we're living in a culture where people don't want to be what the God of the universe designed them to be. And it's just another, a new current manifestation of rebellion against God's goodness. He messed up on how he made us, or he means well, but he doesn't quite have everything under control. Whatever it is, those are direct attacks on the character of God. One of the greatest truths about God is the moral attribute we know is his goodness, that God is good. And Satan said, he doesn't say God isn't good. He said, are you sure God is good? Did God really say that? Doubt his word, doubt his goodness. Onward, look at the next thing in verse 4. His authority. Doubt God's authority. He says in verse 4, uh, Then the serpent said to the woman, Genesis 3, 4, You will not surely die. This is, this is doubting God's authority. What Satan wants us to do is to doubt that God has authority. We doubt God when we doubt his authority. Satan wants us to believe God is not in charge. We are. That's where our culture is going. Public opinion. Polling and finding what the, the majority say is what is becoming the new basis for authority. What, what the masses want, what the majority wants. God says, nope. Even if everybody doesn't agree, it's true, because I said it. God says, you're not in charge, I am. We doubt God's authority when we say God isn't interested in our choices. We're in charge. No, you're in charge when you're driven by the sin and lust of the flesh. Yes, God says you're walking according to the course of this world, but when I save you and you're bought at a price, then you're supposed to obey me. And that's what surrender is about. We keep going back. In fact, I just did um, a wedding down at the other end of the building yesterday afternoon. It was really an amazing wedding, and then many of you were there. And, uh, and it, was, it was so neat. And I looked at the groom, and I said, I want all of you to hold him accountable for this. He has got to start practicing the nine most important words in any relationship. And they're the same nine words that affects us with God. Did you know I break fellowship with God and the only way back is to say I was wrong. In other words, I sinned. I am sorry. I repent. Please forgive me. Those are the nine words. They work in every marriage. I was wrong. I am sorry. Please forgive me. But if we're in charge, we're never wrong. We never have to say I was wrong. We never have to say I'm sorry. And we never need forgiveness. We're in charge. We do it our way. God says, I'm going to make you accountable for your deeds. But people who are in charge say, no, you're not. Uh, I'm going to doubt your authority. And then doubt your 
plan. Uh, look, look what it says in verse 5. The devil says, For God knows that as soon as you start going my way instead of his way, and you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God. This is a promise of religion. That you go religion's way, you'll be like God. Your eyes will be open. We doubt God when we doubt his plan. God wants us to believe that there is a or Satan wants us to believe that there's a better way to immortality. By the way, the newest one is they're downloading minds and they're gonna put them online and so you can live forever. They're gonna download your mind because the brain is basically electrical impulses. So they're gonna put some kind of electrode back there, kind of a matrix in the back and they're gonna suck out all the brain uh, electric parts and they are going to let people have immortality in cyberspace. Isn't that interesting? That's the newest rendition of Satan's idea. And Satan wants us to believe that there is a better way to immortality than God's way, an easier way, a quicker way to happiness. Again, this is an attack on the very word of God, and God's word is sufficient. And that's one of the characteristics God has told us about his word. The sufficiency of God's word means that everything God wants to tell us about how we should think about a particular doctrinal issue or a particular moral situation is found in scripture. God has a wonderful and perfect plan revealed in his word, and every time we open his word, we hear his plan. The question is, how often do we open it? Here's the last point. God's word, any part of it, any truth about God that in a moment of temptation that we affirm begins the process of extinguishing every part of Satan's attack. Do you understand that? It disrupts it, it sets Satan off balance when in the moment that we're attacked, in our minds, we believe God, any part of his word. It immediately has us exercising faith, which always works. It extinguishes the fiery darts of the wicked one. Let me just show you where we're going to pick up next time because I can't. When we face pain, God says, trust my wisdom. I'm bringing that into your life. Satan says, God isn't really good. He shouldn't make you painful. When we face sorrow, God says, trust my love. I, I know. I love you so much, I won't bring anything into your life. Satan says, God doesn't really care. When we face temptation, God says, trust my timing. Most temptations are wanting things. We want to satisfy a legitimate desire but we want to satisfy it in an illegitimate way, usually in a hurried way. We want it on our timing, not God's. And then Satan says, God doesn't understand your needs. Go ahead and do it. We have some kind of a loss. God says, trust my presence. I'm with you going through there. God's not strong enough to protect you against that loss. When we have sickness, God says, trust my power. I'm the one that created your body. I know what's going on. Satan says, God's not really in control. He let that sickness come. When we have lust, God says, trust my plans. I designed you for a purpose and I put all, I know all those desires. I'm the one that invented sexual desires, God says. Trust my plans. Follow my, my plans. God doesn't really want me to be happy. And then we'll come back to the specific verses, and I'm going to share for the seven, you've heard of the seven mortal sins, there is a specific verse that addresses each one. And we're going to talk about how to, as Luther said, through one little word, to fell him. But for us this morning, the shield of faith is the word of God. And God's word is the shield of faith. It always works. That's why I wanted the little people, I wanted to see whether they had the simplest verse memorized. Did you know when you're facing life and death situations, you can say, God so loved me that he gave his only son. I'm never going to perish. See, that's, that's believing God's word. Faith in his word shields me from anything that Satan can put at me. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer as we bow. The men are going to prepare to serve us communion. We're going to have the most glorious ending to our fellowship Sunday service by celebrating communion together as those who are partaking of the shield of faith, the word of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for Peter who had a living hope. We thank you for your word which tells us Satan's plan. He's always going to be shooting at us. He knows where to shoot. In our pain, in our sorrow, in our loss, in our needs, in our and our longings, 
and he inflames those to make us doubt your word, your goodness, your plan, your authority. I pray that we would, by faith, start laying hold of your word, that we would make our daily time listening to your voice and your word a time when we start learning and absorbing and holding on to truth. And we will see Satan banished from more and more areas that in the past he has inflamed in our lives. I pray this would be a communion of faith, that we would say we want you to increase our faith, and faith comes by hearing the word of God. And this might be a communion when we say, I want to hear more of your word in my life so that Satan's attacks will be more and more extinguished. Thank you for the bread, a picture of your body that opened the door for life for us. May our worship of gratitude and thanksgiving rise before you now. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.